come on then. Oh. Astronomy is a sound science. We have proven countless aspects of it with solid investigations, experiments and observations. We've known all about the stars and planets for hundreds of years, going back to the worlds of Tycho Brahe, Galileo, Isaac Newton and Copernicus. Yet there appears to be one YouTuber who wants to rewrite the textbook when it comes to astronomy. So today we're going to have a look at his Astronomy 101 video to see if he's right. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tin Fall Tuesday with me, Simon and Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. So the YouTuber in question for today's video is someone by the name of Talking to Leeds Kalnin. And they seem to be very excited that I'm going to try and debunk their video. Now I was going to do this video last Tuesday, but opted for the evolution one from Kyle instead. Talking to Leeds Kalnin was not impressed. Here is his community post shortly after I released last Tuesday's video. Simon Dan, Star Talk, Professor Dave explains, Dr. Becky, NASA, powerful JRE. Your boy said he was going to take me on and then back down. What happened? I told you they would run from the facts. He wanted to make a video, but he can't. He doesn't have any answers, so how could he? The data is correct, and since it can't be argued with, it must be ignored. That's a crying shame, and a perfect example of the problem with science today. Literally the smartest thing Simon Dan has ever done is decide not to engage me in debate about how the Earth goes around the Sun. The only move he had was no move at all. Good move, Dan. Good move. I will say it again. I wield the sword of Leeds Kalnin and cannot be defeated. Who is next? Well, let's see what this is all about, shall we? The Red Door. So, what he shows, and I'll throw up the graphic here uh, as I'm talking so you can look at it. It has an unusual drawing on it, and it has what looks like the Sun, and then it says Earth 21, and then it has what looks like the Earth here and the Earth here, showing the uh, apex and the apogee of our orbit, which seems to contradict what we know about science. Now, um, astronomers believe it to be this way. They don't believe it to be like that. We know it to be like that. All the planets of the solar system are within a few degrees of the ecliptic plane. Pluto, though, is about 17 degrees off. We know all this because of the various probes, satellites and telescopes that we have out there in the solar system. But this is how we go. But Ed shows something completely different, doesn't he? And he invites us to use the Polaris telescope and the sundial. And what he's doing is, with the drawing on the red door, is he's saying, hey guys, this is my math. Feel free to use the instruments that I built to check my math. That's pretty cool, right? It is cool, yes. And the fact that he's even been able to build all this is a testament to his engineering skills. However, Earth's orbit does not look like the one that you've just drawn on that board there. Now the ecliptic, of course, is an imaginary line in the sky in which the Sun and planets travel along. It is defined by our orbit around the Sun and our axial tilt of 23.5 degrees. For example, here in the UK, the ecliptic is lowering the sky during the winter and higher in the sky during the summer because of that tilt. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to ascertain what this drawing is telling us, don't we? We have to say, what is it about this that's different than the current model? And it shows it on an angle. Um, and it also shows that there is a difference in the length of orbits. This is Earth 21, and, and since closer I would say, what he is saying there is that it's 621, and that this is 12. 21. This is summer solstice, winter solstice. Well, there is a difference in the distance to the sun during those two times of year. You've got them the wrong way round though. We're actually close to the sun during the winter solstice. And you're giving us an Astronomy 101 lesson. Amazing. But there's another additional thing on there that people don't seem to talk about or acknowledge. Maybe they don't even really see it. But there's one in the middle, and this is the equinox, right? This is the equinox here. 
and this equinox, since it's equal, is on both sides. And this is where the diagram does make sense. The equinox occurs when the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator. Now it's my postulation that Ed Leeds Kalnin has confused the ecliptic as being our actual path around the sun with a 23.5 degree tilt in our orbit. And if you notice, he is still claiming from his diagram that there's a 23.5 degree tilt in Earth's axis in this new orbit he's claiming. Now that would cause havoc with the days and nights and nothing that we actually experience. So, Notice that it is dead center of the sun during the equinox, but at each of these extreme periods during the year, they're at an angle. Indeed, and for that to work in regards to the seasons, etc., there would need to be no tilt. And I get that this would look the same from our perspective if there was no tilt, but what wouldn't look the same are the planets in the sky. They would not follow the ecliptic as they do now, but of course this is irrelevant because Leeds Callan is still saying there's a 23.5 degree axial tilt. Right. So, we see that there is a difference in the length of orbit between winter and summer. We see that the equinox lines up in the dead center of the sun, and that he has this mapped out for us on the red door, and it completely uh, contravenes what is being said by mainstream astronomy, uh, mainstream science, and the standard model from which we are all taught from, including myself. So to sum up, the red door shows us that there, uh, his drawing uh, has a difference in orbital length between summer and winter. Nothing new there. We know that there is. It also shows that he shows a difference in the orbital angle, or the tilt, in relation to the sun. And this is the thing which he has totally wrong. So, these two things are what we are going to focus on, and it is because he names these two things with the drawing on the red door. He's telling us to our face he shows a difference in orbital length and a difference in the orbital angle. Now, he has put in place something to prove each one of them. He doesn't expect you to believe him. He says, I built these and they defooled me. And they defooled me, and now I'm going to defool you. Well, forget about the cutting edge technology that we've actually got out there. Let's figure it out using some rocks. Which, don't get me wrong, back then is a great achievement, but still. All right, that's what we're here to do. And the first one that shows the orbital length is called the Polaris Telescope. And that's what we're going to talk about next. All right, so we have the Polaris Telescope. And basically, the Polaris Telescope is a 40-foot tall uh, obelisk that was built by Ed. That's made of coral. And it has these crosshairs that are placed in it in wire. Now, here is a picture of it if anyone wants to see the real thing. As you can see, the wire is very straight. And uh, the reason it's called the Polaris Telescope is because uh, any clear night of the year, you can look through this, uh, the, the crosshairs that he has made, and you can see uh, Polaris in one of the four quadrants. All right? And... With this, we know we can mark the seasons. He, he has them marked off in quarters, and he hasn't even just uh, got Polaris accurately within the crosshairs, but what he's done more exactly is he's marked the position of true north because Polaris is a circumpolar star. Now, it is our closest pole star to exact north, but it's off by about two degrees. Now, I looked at this for a long time and even consulted conspiracy cats on it as well. And I think between the two of us, we've come up with a conclusion. If indeed the wires are centered dead on true north, then Polaris would circumnavigate that central point over 24 hours. It would not be in one quadrant per season. Even if it was slightly off true north, it still wouldn't be in one quadrant per season. Now, without going there myself, I can't 100% verify this, but I suspect that is what's going on. And this is exactly what Ed shows. He shows this two degree deviation, and it's only because he has been so accurate as to mark true north. It's 0.7 degrees, not two degrees. 
dear, oh dear. Which is a feat unto itself. But in a clear night of the year, you can see Polaris. And if you track its movements, what you see is something very interesting. Because if, if our pole is pointed at, at north, true north, okay? And so true north would be the sun, the central point. I don't think it would be, no. That we revolve. And the reason uh, that this moves from quadrant to quadrant isn't because the star moves, it's because we move, right? I mean, everybody agrees on that. Even, even mainstream science says, yes, it's because we move, right? Yes, the stars move because of our rotation. And as I stated earlier, Polaris would, would circumnavigate that central point over the course of 24 hours. So, if the star moves because we move, by tracking the star against a central point, it now becomes analogous with our own orbit, doesn't it? Now, this isn't hard to understand. So, what Ed has done is he has tracked the star very closely and has given us our view. He must have tracked it over 24 hours then, because that is the path that Polaris would take over the course of a day. Of our orbit in micro. Right? If you track this every single night and you track the position of the star, what you get is, is a kind of an egg-shaped elliptical orbit. You don't actually. You get a nice neat circle, just like this. This would be the topographical view. If we were looking at our movement, looking down on the Earth as it moves around the sun, this is exactly what we would see, because he has perfectly captured it. No, what that captures, as I've just said, is the rotation of the Earth, not the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Now, this is the ramblings of someone who doesn't have the first clue about astronomy, and he wants to stand there, he's got the gall to give us an Astronomy 101 lesson. Now look, there's over 35 minutes more of this lecture, and if you want me to take another look at the next section, let me know in the comments and I will do that. Now of course, I'm sure uh, this guy is going to respond and tell me I'm talking nonsense, but for now, I think we've proven him wrong enough. We are all done and dusted for another Tin Fall Tuesday. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it today, please do consider hitting the subscribe button. Thank you so much to all the new subscribers who've joined recently. There's been a few of you. And of course, if you really enjoyed it, hit that like button as well. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great week, and I'll see you all on Friday for the return of Mikey Smith and another one of his brilliant experiments. See you then. <laughs>